Uh, this video is the second part of the Vinberg lecture on Vinberg's algorithm and Katz Moody algebras. Um, there should be a link to the first part of the lecture in the description of the video below. So, the first part of the lecture we covered Vinberg's original paper describing his algorithm and his calculation of some reflection groups. Um, this lecture I'm going to discuss mainly Conway and Sloan's approach to Vinberg's results and in particular describe Conway's calculation of the Dinkin diagram of the 26-dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. Um, I'll start just by having a quick review of some of the things from the first lecture. So first of all, we recall the lattice IN, 1 is the lattice in um, Euclidean, well, sorry, Lorentzian space RN, 1. It consists of all vectors M1 up to MN mn plus 1 with mi integers and the norm of this vector, the, the square of its length, is given by m1 squared plus plus mn squared minus mn plus 1 squared. So this is there's a minus sign here as in special relativity. Um, we recall the lattice, um, the even lattice is defined similarly except that all the mi are in z or all the mi are in z plus a half and also the sum of the mi is even. Um, here we take n congruent to 1 modulo 8 and this has the result that all vectors have even norm. And what the first part of this lecture was doing was it was calculating the reflection groups of these lattices using um, Vinberg's algorithm and we saw that uh, we could calculate the Dinkin diagram and we, we found the Dinkin diagram was finite for i n1 for n less than or equal to 19. Um, so here we have a finite Dinkin diagram and the reflection group is a fundamental domain of finite volume but for i n comma 1 for n greater than or equal to 20, um, Vinberg showed that the Dinkin diagram was infinite and, and similarly it's finite for the even lattices for i9 1 and i i i 17 1 but it's infinite for i i 25 1. So there's this big jump in behaviour when n goes from 19 to 20. Um, so what we're going to do is to start off by looking at this case here. Um, so first of all, I want to describe the relation between norm zero vectors of this lattice um, and um, so we take norm zero vectors in this lattice ii251 and Niemeyer lattices. So Niemeyer lattices are the lattices in 24 dimensions. They're even and they're unimodular. That means that the volume of a fundamental domain of the lattice under translation is just one. Um, and there are 24 of these found by Niemeyer. Um, and the most famous one is the Leech lattice, uh, which has no norm two vectors. So the norm two vectors are normally called roots because they correspond to reflections. Um, now if we take a, a Niemeyer lattice, so let's take a Niemeyer lattice L and add on a little two-dimensional um, lattice with with um, inner product matrix that looks like this. So, so it's Lorentzian, it's, it's got norm zero vectors and positive norm vectors and negative norm vectors. Then this is actually isomorphic to the 26 dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. That's because there is only one such lattice optoisomorphism. So this gives you a map from L to norm zero vectors because um, if we choose coordinates for this, we can use coordinates lambda m n with lambda in L and m n integers. And this thing has norm lambda squared plus 2 m n. Um, 
Then we notice the vector w equals 0, 0, 1 has norm 0. So w squared is 0. So this is a way of going from lattices to, to orbits of norm 0 vectors in this lattice here. On the other hand, if we've got a norm 0 vector w, then we can, in this 26-dimensional even Lorentzian lattice, what we can do is we take the orthogonal complement of w, and this is 25-dimensional, and it's not quite positive definite because it's got norm 0 vector w in it, but if we then quotient out by w, this then becomes a Niemeyer lattice. So this gives us a bijection between ne or isomorphism classes of Niemeyer lattices and orbits of primitive norm zero vectors in this lattice here. Um, and you, you can use this in both directions. You can either use the classification of Niemeyer lattices to find the primitive norm zero vectors, or you can run it backwards and use the classification of primitive norm zero vectors to classify the, the Niemeyer lattices. So um, we can give an example of this. Um, for example, we can ask, um, um, can we find a norm zero vector in this lattice here corresponding to the Leech lattice? Um, and this was solved by Conway and Sloan. Um, so we, we've got to find some vector m0, m1, up to m24, m25, um, and we, um, whose orthogonal complement mo modulo w itself is the Leech lattice. In particular, that, that, that there can be no norm 2 vectors orthogonal to this. And you notice if, it, if two of these numbers were equal, so if mn was equal to mn plus 1, then we would have a norm 2 vector orthogonal to this, which just looks like 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on. So mn is, is not equal to mn plus 1 for, um, for, for any n. I should say we may as well arrange these so that they're increasing order. So we've got to find an increasing series of integers um, such that um, no two of them are equal up to sign. And there's an obvious way of doing this, which is we just take 0, 1, 2, up to 24. Now we've um, got to put something there. And now there's another constraint, which we must have omega squared equals 0. Um, and that means we've got to find a number here whose square is equal to the sum of the squares of these numbers. And by a weird coincidence, there is such a number, which is 70, because... 0 squared plus 1 squared, and so on all the way up to plus 24 squared is equal to 70 squared. Um, incidentally, 24 is the only non-trivial solution to this equation, apart from, you know, you can have 0 squared plus 1 squared equals 1 squared, but apart from that, um, the, 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 there are no other cases when the sum of the first n squares is a square. Um, and now the vector omega perp over omega is the Leech lattice. Um, it's not all that easy to show that there are no other norm 2 vectors orthogonal to this. I mean, we've shown there are no obvious norm 2 vectors orthogonal to this, but there, you know, how do you know there are some, aren't some non-obvious ones? Um, so um, next we come on to the uh, result by Conway, Parker and Sloan. Um, which asks, what is the covering radius of the Leech lattice? Leech lattice is normally denoted by a capital lambda standing for Leech. Um, so this means what, what you do is you take spheres of radius R around lattice points, Um, so, so, so they just cover the whole of the, 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 the real vector space corresponding to the Leech lattice. So this shouldn't be confused with the packing radius. And the packing radius asks, what is the 
biggest sphere you can put round every point such that the spheres don't overlap. The covering radius asks what is the smallest um, sphere you can put round every point so that the, the, the insides of these spheres actually cover space. So for example if I've got a, um, a triangular lattice in two dimensions um, the, the, um, the, the, the packing radius you'd be looking for spheres that um, don't overlap. So, so, so these would give you spheres of the packing radius. The covering radius, on the other hand, you're looking for bigger spheres that cover the lattice. So here you would have bigger spheres at this time they, that they are going to be overlapping. And you see the, the, these slightly bigger spheres are actually covering R2, whereas these spheres are disjoint. So this is the covering radius that, that we're going to be interested in. And the points at maximal distance from all lattice points, like this point here, are going to be called deep holes. They're sort of, the, in some sense, the biggest holes you can find in the lattice that are, that are um, as far as possible from lattice points. Um, and um, what they found is that the covering radius of the leech lattice is the square root of 2, exactly. This is a really amazing fact. Um, their calculation of this is was rather long and difficult. Um, in general, calculating the covering radius of a lattice is rather hard. You, you just have to... Um, 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 sort of get your hands dirty doing a lot of calculation considering all cases. So most of the papers by Conway and Sloan um, that I'm talking about this lecture have been reproduced in the book Sphere Packings, Lattices and Groups. Um, in particular, I just wanted to show you um, what their calculation of the covering radius of the leech lattice looks like. So here's their paper. It's, it's chapter 23 of the book. And if you look through it, you see you're getting large numbers of case-by-case -case calculations. Here they're writing down vectors of the leech lattice. Um, here they have a big table showing all the different um, ways of finding a certain an inside the leech lattice. I'll explain that in a moment. And it sort of goes on like this for many, many pages. There are, there, there are huge numbers of cases to consider. And the reason they had to consider so many cases is there are actually the answer is rather complicated. There are 23 orbits of deep hole. So they had to actually find all these different orbits and show there are no other orbits. And the amazing thing is these correspond to the 23 Nimai lattices that are not the leech lattice. There are 24 Nimai lattices, one of which is the leech lattice, and there are it's the 23 others that appear corresponding to the 23 holes. Um, now, how do the Nimai lattices correspond to holes? Well, um, let's take a typical Nimai lattice. For instance, we can look at the Nimai lattice E8 cubed. And you look at the Dinkin diagram of the reflection group of this Nimai lattice. So we draw three copies of E8. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So here's one. Um, and here's another, and here's another. And so, so, so this is the Dinkin diagram of E8 cubed. And now I'm going to make it into an affine Dinkin diagram. And to make it into an affine Dinkin diagram for E8, you just add on these three points here. And now I'm going to make these correspond to a configuration of vectors in the Leech lattice as follows. So if I've got two points in the Dinkin diagram not joined, I want V to have distance 4 from W. And if they are joined, VW, then V minus W squared should be 6. So um, this looks absolutely bizarre. You're, you're taking a, an affine Dinkin diagram and using that to construct a configuration of vectors in the Leech lattice. And these... Um, um, and if you take a configuration like this, these turn out to be the vertices of a deep hole. 
The vertices of a deep hole just mean the lattice vectors nearest to the deep hole. And Conway and Sloan found that they, that they got this exact correspondence between um, um, the affine Dinkin diagrams of the Niemeyer lattice and the deep holes of the, Le of the Leach lattice. This, this correspondence was first suggested by Richard Parker, who somehow noticed, um, I, I think he knew a, a couple of holes in the Leach lattice and sort of noticed these seem to correspond to the Niemeyer lattices A1 to the 24 and A2 to the 12 and pointed this out to Conway and Conway and Sloan then got rather excited about this and checked this work for all the other Niemeyer lattices. I have no idea how Richard Parker came up with this idea because the Niemeyer lattices were a pretty obscure topic at the time. The Leach lattice was also pretty obscure. So he was somehow putting together these two um, very obscure um, um, objects. So, um, so how can we explain this? Um, well, we, we can explain this by recalling that Niemeyer lattices correspond to norm zero vectors in, in the 26-dimensional Lorentzian lattice. So here we take, this is going to be a Niemeyer lattice. Um, and if we take um, one of these norm zero vectors in the 26-dimensional even Lorentzian lattice, we can look at the roots of the 26-dimensional even Lorentzian lattice, which are um, orthogonal to um, W. And these will be just the roots of the affine Niemeyer lattice. This is because the orthogonal complement of W is just the Niemeyer lattice plus a little zero dimensional lattice and it's not difficult to check the root system of that is is just the correspond you just, is, just get the corresponding affine um, group. Um, and Conway discovered that the Dinkin diagram of um, the Leach lattice, so the Dinkin diagram of II25, comma one is the Leach lattice. And this doesn't even seem to make sense um, because, you know, the Dinkin diagram of this lattice is going to be some sort of um, graph with various distances between points. And the Leach lattice is a set of points in Euclidean space. So how, how on, what on earth do you mean by saying they're the same? Well, they're actually isometric. So both of these are metric spaces. The Dinkin diagram consists of simple roots, and you can talk about the distance between two simple roots. And of course, the Leach lattice is a subset of 24 dimensional space, so it's a metric space. Um, so let's see how they are actually isometric. Well, um, what Conway did was he applied Vinberg's algorithm to the 26-dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. And you've got to choose coordinates for this. And the obvious coordinates are to choose, you know, integers m1 up to m25, as I had before. But Conway chose another coordinate system. He chose to write it as the Leach lattice plus 0, 1, 1, 0. So um, the vectors are going to be of the form lambda mn, where lambda is in the Leach lattice and m and n are integers. Um, and um, um, th this thing has norm lambda squared plus 2mn. And there are two conventions. You sometimes put a minus one there instead. And I, again, this is something I sometimes get confused about, so there may be a few sign errors. Now for Vinberg's algorithm, you remember you have to start by choosing a sort of special controlling vector, which I'm going to take to be 0, 0, 1. So the orthogonal complement of p divided by p 
is, is, is just the leech lattice. And now we're going to find the simple roots of this 26 dimensional lattice in an order of their inner product with P. So we want RP to be 0, 1, 2, and so on. And of course, we want R squared equals 0. So if RP is 0, well, then you, you, you see that, um, that the vector lambda mn would have the property that lambda squared was 2. And the Leech lattice has no vectors of norm 2. Sorry, that should be a 2, not a 0. So, um, so there are no... Um, no simple roots that have inner product zero with p. Now let's look at the vectors with rp equals one. Well, well, here we get the vectors lambda one, um, lambda squared over two minus one for any vector lambda in the Leech lattice. So we've got an infinite number of roots of level one, um, in accordance with Vinberg's discovery that the that the, the root system is infinite. So this is the first batch of simple roots. And the amazing thing that Conway noticed is there are no more. And um, this depends on the fact that lambda has covering radius root 2. And let's see why this is true. So... Um, Suppose we've got some simple roots. So suppose lambda a b is simple. Now this means that it has um, inner product less than or equal to naught with all simple roots of the form mu m. So sorry, mu one. Um, mu squared over 2 minus 1. And if you work out what this condition is, you just work out the inner product of these two vectors, and you find it's equivalent to saying that lambda minus v over a squared is greater than or equal to 2 plus 2 over a squared. So that should be a mu minus um lambda over a squared is greater than 2 plus 2 over a squared which is greater than 2 and this is not possible because the leech lattice has covering radius root 2 so you can't find any vectors mu that have and any vectors lambda over a that have distance greater than root 2 from all all vectors mu um, so um, now this, this explains um, the correspondence between Niemeyer lattices and deep holes because the, the, the deep hole is just the set of um, simple roots in the Leech lattice corresponding to the Dinker diagram of the Niemeyer lattice. And Conway and Sloan now use this to reinterpret Vinberg's results on the reflection group of i n comma one and um i n comma one can almost be embedded in the leech lattice it can't quite be embedded because this has um vectors of odd norm and all vectors in in the 26 dimensional lorentzian lattice of even norm so let's take a dinkin diagram d n looking something like this and um, we can embed this inside the Leech lattice, considered as the root system, so as, as the Dinkin diagram of the 26 dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. As I said, Con Conway showed that the Leech lattice is this. And then if we look at the orthogonal complement of Dn, this is going to be the even sublattice of i25 minus n comma 1 and um, this consists of all vectors m1 up to 
um, m25 minus minus n um, m something such that the mi are integral and the sum of the mi is even. Now this lattice usually has the same reflection group as i25 minus n1. Usually does that. There are a few cases when it doesn't, but we will we'll, we'll see later. Um, so um, all we have to do is to work out what is the Dinkin diagram of this lattice here. And Conway and Sh Sloan showed that it, uh, the, the Dinkin diagram of um, the orthogonal complement of Dn can be obtained as follows. Take all points um, P of lambda so that P union the Dn is a spherical Dinkin diagram. Now the reason for this is that this is the condition that um, the projection of P in the lattice D and perp has norm greater than zero. And if you want this projection to be a root, it certainly has to have norm greater than zero. There's also actually another condition that it has to satisfy that I'll be discussing a little bit later, but for the moment um, we're not going to worry about it. Um, so let's see what happens as we go through the various possibilities for dn. So let's take dn for n greater than or equal to 8. Um, I'm just going to write out the case for n equals 8. So we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So here's the Dinkin diagram d8. And there are just two ways we can add a point to this to get um, a spherical Dinkin diagram. First of all, we can add a point here and then we get dn a1. So we just add an a1. And this turns out to give you a norm 2 root in um, i25 uh, minus n1. The other thing we can do is we can add on a uh, a new root here. This gives us a dn plus 1 Dinkin diagram and this gives us a norm 1 root. So th th this uh, um, explains where we're getting norm 2 and norm 1 roots from there from the two ways of extending dn to a bigger spherical Dinkin diagram. So now let's look at d7 where something a little uh, um, little extra happens. So let's take d7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And now um, there are three things we can do because as well as we can add a point there or we can add a point here just as before and these give us norm 2 and norm 1 roots but there's a third thing we can do. We can add on a root here and we get an e8 Dinkin diagram and these give us norm 1 roots. Well um, this also gives us norm 1 roots. So what's the difference between these sorts of norm 1 roots? Well the difference is that these norm 1 roots are parity vectors. So you remember a parity vector is a root r such that the inner product of r with v is congruent to v v mod 2 for all vectors v. Um, so you remember um, this corresponds to the case of um, i um, 18 1 and you remember I commented in the previous lecture that in the case of I18-1, Vinberg and Kaplinskaya found that they actually got three sorts of roots. And the reason for the third sort of root is coming from this E8 Dinkin diagram, and it's, it, it's giving you this, this funny extra parity vector. 
Um, you can't do this for I17-1 because that would be an E9 Dinkin diagram and the E9 Dinkin diagram doesn't give you a, a spherical or positive definite root system. And we can do the same thing for D6. So, so, that, so this is the D7 case. D6 is kind of similar. One, two, three, four, five, six. And again, we can add roots there or we can add a root here and this again gives us norm one and this gives us norm two and this time we can add in a root here and this gives us an e7 and this gives us now gives us norm two roots and again, the, the, these norm two roots are parity vectors, so we, 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 we get a second batch of norm two roots in the case of I191. Um, so um, this accounts for um, Vinberg's diagrams. Um, also, it makes it rather easier to calculate the Dinkin diagrams because you just have to search for certain vectors in the Leach lattice which turns out to be rather easier than running Vinberg's algorithm. Um, so what happens for the case D5? So let's take a look. So, so here, just as before, um, the possibilities are we could add a point there and get a norm two, two root, or we could add a uh, a vector here and get a norm one root or we could add a vector I think I'm using purple for these we'd add a vector here and this time we get an e6 root well except it's not a root because this gives us norm three vectors and these are not roots Um, and this accounts for why, um, why if you take the lattice I21, um, the reflection, the, the Dinkin diagram is actually infinite. I mean, roughly speaking, if this was a root, then, 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 then we'd find a finite fundamental domain for the reflection root. But because this gives us something that isn't a root, we... we, we, we we, we only get an infinite fundamental domain. Um, the question is, why is this not a root? Um, so if you take the vector here, we get a perfectly good positive norm vector in the lattice I21. And it turns out there's an extra condition we need to satisfy for this to be a root. Um, Dinkin diagrams have something called an opposition involution. Um, and what this does is, um, it's an autom it, you, you, if, if you take uh, the root system contained in um, Euclidean space Rn, then um, Rn has an automorphism minus 1. You can just multiply all vectors by minus 1. And this can be written as a product of reflections times an automorphism of the Dinkin diagram. Um, and uh, this automorphism turns out to be of order one or two, and we can see what it is in various cases. If you take a n, then the opposition involution just does the obvious thing, so it's non-trivial unless n equals one. If you look at dn, it's a bit subtle. It depends on whether n is odd or even. So if for dn n even, it does nothing. For dn n odd, it flips these two vectors here. And for e6, it flips um, the, the, the two endpoints. And for e7, it does nothing. It can't do anything because e7 has a trivial automorphism group. And for e8, it does nothing. And now the problem is that is the fact that the this opposition involution for E6 um, has norm 
is is non-trivial and it turns out that um for in order to get a root what you would need is if you take the d5 that we were looking at and extend it to an e6 we notice the opposition involution of this e6 acts like this so the opposition involution of e6 does not preserve um, the d5 subdiagram, and this is what is causing the problem if you look at all the other cases we had we see that the opposition involution of the bigger dinkin diagram you know preserves the smaller dinkin diagram i mean you know the if we take dn inside dn plus one then the opposition involution of dn plus one is always preserving dn so this is this is what is causing um the dinkin diagram of, of the lorentzian lattice to become infinite and that we can now see why i21 has an infinite dinkin diagram and the reason is that 20 is equal to the dimension of i i 25 1 minus the dimension of e6 um, now Vinberg had a different reason for why the, the Dinkin diagram becomes infinite so Vinberg pointed out there were two lattices a11 d7 and e6 cubed as I mentioned in the previous video such that the rank of the root system is only 18 whereas the lattice is dimension 19. So we seem to have two completely different explanations for why things break down. One says that E6 has this funny extra um, opposition involution, whereas Vinberg's explanation says you get these two extra lattices in dimension 19 with not enough roots. Well, it turns out these two explanations are really more or less the same. Um, the question is, how do you get these two lattices? Well, there are two Niemeyer lattices, A11, D7, E6, and E6 to the 4, or at least that's their root systems. And you can get these two lattices <coughs> by taking the orthogonal complement of a D5, which is contained in some E6, which is contained in, inside some Niemeyer lattice. So we're taking the Niemeyer lattices that contain an E6 component, taking the D5 inside them and then taking the orthogonal complement of that. And that gives you the even sublattice of these unimodular lattices. So in both cases, the problem is caused by this D5 being embedded in E6 in a funny way such that the orthogonal complement of the D5 is not a root. Um, so that sort of explains exactly why Vinberg's algorithm breaks down at, um, uh, at a particular dimension. Well, we can go further. Um, so um, let's look at the case of um, D4. So this is going to correspond to the lattice I21, comma 1. And Dinkin proved that the reflection group again has infinite Dinkin diagram. And let's take a look at the possibilities. Well, first of all, we can have norm two roots. And then we can add in a root here. So this has norm one. Um, and this is giving us a D5 Dinkin diagram. And then there are two ways of extending this D4 to an E5. We can either add a point here or we could add a point here so what's e5 well well e5 looks like this and you see it's actually the same as d5 so um these two ways of adding extra roots are really the same as this way of adding a root um, and in fact if you count how many ways of doing this there are there are 56 roots like this and 56 like this and 56 like this and uh, for that matter there are 42 times that um, and if you look at the opposition involution of d5 you see it's actually fixing this d4 i mean the opposition involution of this d5 flips these two vertices but that's okay that maps d4 to itself so this seems to be prediction that we should get a finite dinkin diagram um, with 
um, 56 plus 56 plus 56 plus 42 um, um, points comes out to 210. So um, um, we, we, we seem at first sight to have a contradiction. So, so Vinberg's algorithm is saying that the Dinkin diagram of this lattice is infinite, but um, here we seem to have an argument saying that the Dinkin diagram of the complement of this D4 is finite. Well, um, the, the complements of this D4 is the even sublattice of I21 1. And the even sublattice usually have the same automorphism group, but in this particular case, these things have different automorphism groups. In fact, the automorphism group of this lattice is three times as large as the automorphism group of that lattice in some sense. Well, I mean, they're both infinite groups. One, one has index three in the other. Um, and um, in order to understand what's going on, it's easier to look inside a small di smaller dimension. So this is in 22 dimensions, which is a bit hard to figure out. But we can see the same thing going on with D4. So D4 is contained in the lattice I4. So I4 is just all vectors M1 up to M4 with Mi in Z. And D4 actually con is contained in three different copies of I4. Um, and we can see this as follows. So D4 is the set of all vectors like this with the sum of the mi even. And we can um, extend D4 in three different ways. So we can either add the points m1 up to m4 with mi odd, and this just gives us the lattice i4, or we can add the points um, m1 up to m4 with mi in z plus a half and the sum even or we can add the points m1 up to m4 with mi in z plus a half and the sum is odd um, and if we do this we notice the vector a half a half a half a half actually has norm one and in fact, we can find enough other vectors of norm one that we're actually getting that, that, that this lattice is actually isomorphic to I4. So we've actually got three different copies of I4. Um, you notice this is something funny that happens whenever the dimension is congruent to four modulo eight, except in general, we won't get norm one vectors, but we're, we're in, in dimension four, we happen to get norm vectors. Um, and the same sort of thing is happening for um, if we take I21 1 and take its even sublattice is contained in three copies of I21 1. Um, so um, what, what's going on is that um, um, the even sublattice and this lattice here have different automorphism groups because this has many more roots of norm 4. Um, so these aren't roots of norm 4 of this unimodular lattice, but they are roots of norm 4 if it's even sublattice. So this is how how, how the um, how the uh, how the um, Dinkin diagram of the even sublattice of this lattice can actually be finite, even though the Dinkin diagram of this lattice is infinite. We have a sort of summary table as follows. So let's do a summary. So let's take the lattices d8 perp, d7 perp, d6 perp, 
d5 perp d4 perp d3 perp and d2 perp so um you notice d3 is just the same as a3 and d2 is the same as a1 squared so i'm going to take th th these are all going to be sub lattices of the rentian lattice um, in 26 dimensions so here we're getting the lattice i17 1 rather we're getting the even sub lattices of these lattices here octa i um, 23 1 um, and um, we can get three different sorts of roots we can get the roots corresponding to a1 dn which are all norm two roots or we can get the roots corresponding to dn plus one which are all norm one or we can get the roots corresponding to e something en so so um um here that there aren't any um so this should be e n plus one because e9 isn't a spherical dinkin diagram but here the roots of norm one um two three four five and six and there's another special property that these roots have which that they are parity vectors so um let's see what happens uh well here the extra roots of norm one or two so they're they're, they're just roots and this gives Vinberg and Kaplinskaya's example when the um, um, uh, when 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 the um, reflection group is still infinite. Well, here um, a norm three vector is not a root, so uh, we, we we get the dividing line between. The cases when this lattice is as finite Dinkin diagram, the cases when it's an infinite Dinkin diagram. But this case is a bit funny because these vectors are still roots of the even sub lattice. The point is they have norm four, but they're also parity vectors. And um, this means if you take the root and take the inner product with V, um, this is always even. And this means that um, 2RV over RR is now always an integer because this is 4 and, can, and, and we've got a factor of 2 here and a factor of 2 here. So, so in this particular case, we still get roots. And in these cases, it's still, we still get not, um, they're, they're still not roots. So there's this funny um, extra thing going on in in, in in 22 dimensions where we unexpectedly get some roots um well we can also um take a closer look at the um case of d5 so the case of d5 um perp was the even sublattice of i21 um, and this still has um, infinite Dinkin diagram. Um, but we can ask, can we describe the Dinkin diagram, even though it's infinite? And the answer is we can sort of. And the point is the fundamental domain of the reflection group is tree-like. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's draw um, hyperbolic space as um, the unit disk. And here I, I, I'm really talking about hyperbolic space in 20 dimensions, but I'm drawing it as if it were two dimensional. And if we draw the fundamental domain, then you can think of it as being something like this. What's happening is um, we get a lot of roots um, and these are kind of dividing up the um, fundamental domain and the fundamental domain is is um, looks a bit like this we get a sort of tree-like structure and the reason we get a tree-like structure is um, we can add in the hyperplanes of norms of the norm three vectors and these are not roots but they still divide up the fundamental domain into pieces of finite volume if they were roots 
then then we would get a finite volume fundamental domain and what what we end up with is we get a sort of tree here um we can check that we're getting a sort of nice structure looking like this um except there aren't three things coming from each node there are quite a lot of things coming from each node but um and um if you've got a tree you can quite often describe its automorphism group as an amalgamated product um, uh, Sayer has a nice book on this called Trees, and there are a few pictures of this. So, so here's a picture of a tree, and here's a picture of the upper half plane model of um, hyperbolic space, where he's drawn a sort of tree here. And this tree is acted on by SL2Z acting on the upper half plane in the usual way. And Sayer points out the fact that SL2Z is acting on this tree means you can write SL2Z as an amalgamated product of two groups. In fact, it's an amalgamated product of a cyclic group of order four and six amalgamated over a cyclic group of order two, um, since this is a bit hard to read. Um, and the same thing happens here. But because the fundamental domain has a sort of tree-like structure, we, we can actually describe the automorphism group of the fundamental domain as an amalgamated product. So the automorphism group of the Dinkin diagram can be written as follows. It's GE6 amalgamated over GD5 contained in E6 um, with GD5. So what does this mean? Well, this means that the sub the, the, the subgroup of the group of automorphisms of the Leech lattice that preserves this E6 Dinkin diagram. And this means the sub subgroup that preserves both the D5 and the E6 contained in it, and um, similarly for this one. And we can work out the um, orders of these groups. Um, this is a little group of order 72, this group is order 36, and this group is order 1440. So this gives us a description of the automorphism group of the Dinkin diagram. It's just an amalgamated product of these three groups here. Um, you notice that these groups have indexed two. And this is kind of because this reflection is sort of trying to be a, a this, sorry, this vector is trying to be a root giving you a reflection. And if it was a reflection, then this group would be this group times a cyclic group of order two, and it would have indexed two. And this still is indexed two, but it's not quite a product. Um, it's, I mean, it turns out what you're getting is not a reflection, but a kind of reflection twiddled by a, another non-trivial automorphism. Um, so um, in some sense, if, if, if we if if the vector here was a root, then we would sort of delete this bit of the Dinkin diagram and the automorphism group of the Dinkin diagram would just be this. But but we, we have this extra bit because the vectors we're getting here are not roots. Um, so um, um, what, what um, I, I should mention that um, in, in the case of the even sublattice of 21 comma 1, which had a finite Dinkin diagram, um, Dolgachev and Kondo found that the, 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 this group, let's say the even vectors of this, actually turns up naturally in algebraic geometry. Um, uh, in fact, there's a super singular A3 with the Picard group of it, so it's so super singular K3 and characteristic 2 with the Picard group that corresponds to this lattice here. And um, as, as a result, you get the this um, this Dinkin diagram with finite reflection group turning up naturally in algebraic geometry. Um, um, you, you, you can ask what happens if you go to um higher dimensions so we've done the case of i i 25 one well then you can ask what happens if you go to the next case which is i i 33 one and 
Here you seem to get a horrendous mess. There seems to be no analogue of the leech lattice. There's nothing with covering radius root 2. The Dinkin diagram is absolutely huge. Um, you can see roughly how complicated it is by, by looking at the number of orbits of norm 0 vectors in the following cases. So for i, i9, 1, there's one orbit of norm, primitive norm 0 vector. For i, i17, 1, there are two orbits. Here we get 24 orbits found by Niemeyer. Um, this one we get more than a billion orbits. This is an estimate due to Oliver King, who used a refined form of the Minkowski Ziegel mass formula to, to find a, um, a very large lower bound for the number of orbits of norm zero vectors here. And so these correspond to 32 dimensional even unimodular lattices. So there are at least a billion of those. And Classifying them probably would be within reach of a big computer, but it, I mean, the, the main obstruction is it's rather hard to think of any point in classifying them. I mean, there are huge numbers of lattices. They all look very similar and classifying them. It, it's a bit like trying to classify all grains of sand on a beach. I mean, the grains of sand are all different, but who cares? Um, so what seems to be happening for Vinberg's algorithm is that for small dimension, less than or equal to about 25, things are kind of tame and we can quite often classify them. Um, um, for dimension greater than about 25, um, the reflection groups all seem to become rather wild, um, that they're very large and rather difficult to describe and they all have infinite Dinkin diagrams and so on and the thing that seems to be causing this difference is the leech lattice so the leech lattice is sort of on the boundary and the leech lattice is the Dinkin diagram of the 26 dimensional Lorentzian lattice and what seems to be going on is that um you can use the 26 dimensional lattice to control things in dimension less than 26 and mo and many of the reflection groups are reasonably nice at least if they're small discriminant but once you go beyond this things just go crazy um people have of course um um done a lot of work on classifying lattices um with finite reflection groups in dimension up to 25. Um, the classification is a bit complicated because there are all sorts of different things you can look at. So for instance, the fundamental domain can be compact or it can be finite volume, but not compact, or it can be um, infinite volume. And the infinite volume case is still interesting. For example, um, Conway's um, example of the 26 dimensional even Lorentzian lattice is perhaps the most interesting of all um, reflection groups and that has a fundamental domain of infinite volume so you you can't even restrict a finite volume um, you can also ask um, should the um, should you take a lattice or, or you can ask for um, could be a lattice over z or over um, some sort of number field Um, or it could be um, a non-arithmetic um, group. And lattices over z are what we've been discussing. Um, there are some quite striking examples over number fields. In particular, the biggest known examples um, um, over um, um, the biggest known examples with compact fundamental domain were found by Bugayenko, and he was working over a number field um, generated by a square root of five. Um, his examples are still very mysterious. Um, they're in about eight dimensions, and I don't know how to relate them to um, this group here, although I suspect there might be some relation. Um, also, um, we can talk about whether... Um, the reflection groups are maximal or non-maximal. And I'll, I'll just summarise a few of um, 
the examples. Um, um, for more about this, there's a very nice survey article um, written by um, Bela Lipetsky, and I'll try and put a link to that in the video description below. Um, so the most striking result of all is by Vinberg, which says there are no finite volume in large dimensions. And uh, I find this result really amazing because um, for Euclidean and spherical groups, there are finite volume or compact examples in all dimensions. And if you look at hyperbolic groups in small dimensions, there seem to be vastly more hyperbolic reflection groups than, than, than for Euclidean and spherical reflection groups. And, and you'd expect this to get even worse as dimension increases, and it doesn't first. But when you start hitting 20 dimensions, the number suddenly plummets down to almost zero. Um, so that the largest known example is in um, hyperbolic space of dimension 21. Um, so Esselman showed that if you look at reflection groups of lattices, then this is indeed the biggest possible dimension. But whether you can find examples over other number fields or non-arithmetic example fields seems to be a bit unclear. Um, um, Nicolin has classified many of the examples in dimensions, in, in small dimensions, and there are really hundreds of them. You, you, there are just too many to do by hand, and you, you need to get a computer running Vinberg's algorithm in, in order to find them. Um, um, and, um, th there are some finiteness examples. For instance, there are only a finite number of maximal reflection groups in each dimension. So altogether, there are only a f and, and as Vinberg bounded the possible dimensions, this shows that there are a finite number of maximal hyperbolic reflection groups. Daniel Alcock showed that um, up to dimension 19, there are actually an infinite number of non-maximal reflection groups. So, so if you want a finite list, you, you, you need to restrict the maximal ones. Um, well, um, what else can you do with these reflection groups? Well, there's one very obvious thing you can do with them. These reflection groups are all giving you Dinkin diagrams. Now, for the finite and Euclidean Dinkin diagrams, um, these are all Dinkin diagrams of Lie algebras. You get the finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebras and you get the affine katz moody algebras. So an obvious question is, do you get interesting Lie algebras corresponding to the hyperbolic reflection groups? Um, so this will be the subject of the third part of this um, talk, which will appear in the next video.